welcome to the sixth BAT Insight. Uh, these are our exclusive events for British Asian Trust supporters. And today's session, as you'll have realized already, is interactive as well. So it's a bit more of a Zoom call than a sort of closed webinar. Um, as, as everybody knows, these continue to be extremely challenging times globally. And we all know that the situation in South Asia is getting worse every day. So the British Asian Trust is really needed more than ever. These are really difficult times for all charities. But fortunately, the British Asian Trust has an amazing group of trustees, advisors and ambassadors to help ensure that we come through all of this as strongly as, as possible. I'm really pleased that today three of those most important supporters of ours are leading this, this session for us. We're looking at the future of retail after COVID, as, as you know, and I'm delighted that we're in discussion with, with two of the most important figures in the retail industry and also members of the British Asian Trust UK Advisory Council in Tom Singh and Simon Aurora. Um, I'm also delighted that our host today is Rita Lashar, a long-standing supporter and ambassador of the Trust. As, as I'm sure everybody knows, Rittela is an award-winning journalist and news presenter. She currently presents The World Tonight and Saturday PM on BBC Radio 4. And her previous roles at Radio 4 have included uh, Woman's Hour, The World Today and Any Questions. She's also been awarded Media Professional of the Year at the British Asian... Uh, at, she's also been awarded Media Professional of the Year at the Asian Women of Achievement Awards. Anyway, without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Rita Lashar. Thank you so much, Richard, and welcome everyone to this discussion about the future of retail after COVID. Thanks very much to the British Asian Trust for enabling us to come together, albeit by Zoom. Um, like many people of my generation, I spent an awful lot of time in retail, in shops. There was inevitably a family business that involved clothing. Um, I did do a fair bit of shopping too, it has to be said. Um, there was an enormous act of rebellion as well at the age of 17. I turned my back on the family business and I got a job in a china shop in the West End. It was, as you can imagine, a, a moment of Bollywood high drama. So why did I cruelly abandon my family for another job? Well, my dad wouldn't pay for my driving lessons. There you go. Anyway, <laughs> enough of my reminiscing. Back to today. Uh, retailing is in crisis, I think it's fair to say. Debenhams, Monsoon, TM Lewin, Quiz, high street names that have collapsed into insolvency during the last few months. According to the Centre for Retail Research, the retail sector has already lost 91,000 jobs, 12,300 stores this year, and they're projecting there are many more to go. They're talking about at least 100,000 more jobs. It is a moment of enormous upheaval. There was some good news this morning, I think, though, that retail sales were up uh, in June, which is obviously a, a bit of good news. I think the next hour or so should be absolutely fascinating. I'm going to kick off the conversation, but if at any point you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand. As Richard was saying, there should be an icon somewhere on the bottom of your screen, I think. We'll make a note and we will come back to you at the end and we will try and get through as many questions as we can. We would like this to be interactive, so, so please do put your hand up and, and store up those questions. So without further ado, we've got two very distinguished panellists to help us make sense of what is going on on the high street and in a sense they're people who managed to persuade us to go shopping over and over again. Tom Singh is an active philanthropist, entrepreneur and social investor. He's the founder of New Look, a fashion clothing retailer which now has over 900 stores worldwide. He currently holds the position of non-executive board member. Tom's also the founder of Rianta Capital, which invests in social enterprises in India. And his other ongoing charitable activity includes projects such as education, water, agriculture and health. And he's also, of course, a member of the British Asian Trust UK Advisory Council. Simon Aurora is a British businessman and philanthropist. He's CEO of the retail giant B&M, run jointly with his brothers, Bobby and Robin. He too is a member of the British Asian Trust's UK Advisory Council. Simon's other philanthropic interests are centred around social change. His family foundation, Savannah Wisdom, focuses on investing in women and girls at local community level in India and in the UK. Welcome to you both. It is such a pleasure to be able to have this conversation. There's so much to talk about. I gave a few statistics at the top, uh, but Tom, if you want to kick off, how would you describe what's happening in retail in the wake of COVID? Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I uh, just a slight uh, um, 
update on my, where I am in, in my connection to retail. I'm no longer connected with uh, New Look at all. So oh. I, I, uh, I severed my links with UK retail about a year ago. And I'm very relieved that I'm not facing the decimation of by the industry that I was involved in for 50 years. I mean, it's just, um, just uh, as you said, with stores disappearing, shops closing, it's a real crisis. Um, and I've actually turned my focus to learning about online and digital, <laughs> digital marketing. So I've become a traitor to bricks and mortar to an extent. I do, I have to, I want to have my foot in both, both camps in the future. Just to understand how you perceive it now, remind us of how you began. Was it that story that many of us might recognize where you begin small and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger? And do you think that that would be possible for somebody starting now, especially in the light of COVID? But the, the easy way to start uh, a business in fashion today is to go online um, on eBay or on Amazon with a single product so almost anybody can do it which was uh, was different to when I started so I actually started going door to door with my grandfather <laughs> so, and then I was doing the markets while I was at university then I opened a store so I've had quite a long journey and I've actually fulfilled all the functions from buying distribution the whole thing so I, I do have some depth of experience after 50 years. Simon Aurora, how would you describe what's going on right now? You're there in the front line. You've been working all the way through the last few months. Yeah, so I think it's important that we um, understand very clearly what we mean by retail. Um, the decimation you're talking about applies to predominantly the fashion industry, clothing retail. And I think it's sometimes all too easy to be overly uh, focused on one segment of retail, i.e. clothing, as opposed to the huge spectrum of products that obviously are sold to consumers. Um, so I, I would summarize that what the crisis has done is to just simply accelerate that ongoing process that's happened decade in, decade out, century in, century out, where retail constantly reinvents, where uh, certain brands, certain formats fall away, and new challenger brands, new challenger formats take their place in terms of share of consumers' wallets. So leaving clothing to one side, where I think you know, a lot of the names that you mentioned already challenged, and this has accelerated the process. My, my, my pointer on that would be you know, Primark has reopened strongly, and I think most of us would agree that Primark will be around alive and kicking and in great health two, three years from now. Um, but let's turn our attention to the other part of retail, which is actually the largest part of retail, food, products for your home, outdoor products, etc. cetera. Um, actually, we're in rude health. Uh, crisis, what crisis? Um, we're growing at uh, 25 to 30% a year, even through lockdown. Uh, but it's been a really interesting dynamic as one's observed consumer behavior over the last four months. So without sort of going into too much detail, very briefly, three, four weeks before lockdown, the panic buying. And I think what panic buying demonstrates is that as a society, we need shops. Online could not have kept people um, with their pantries full, their um, toiletries and household cleaning goods provided if it was all reliant upon vans delivering to your house. So we are little old B&M, we were supplying six to seven million shoppers every single week for the lockdown period as indeed did our peers, and of course, we can all remember the empty shelves in the supermarkets. You then go into lockdown, which was about a three-week period where our footfall collapsed. And you know, we're an essential retailer, most of what we sell is essential goods, but oh my gosh, we were really worried. Is this what the future holds? It was existential concern. Uh, because if you have a 50%, 60% collapse in footfall, uh, fixed cost business like um, bricks and mortar retail can't survive. But actually, thankfully, what we've seen is consumer confidence has slowly recovered in terms of venturing out to the shops. One would also argue that the stockpiled goods from the pre lockdown were exhausted, so you had to come out again. Yeah. And so we went from uh, going from minus 50% footfall and then over a 12 week period to where we are today, which is about a minus 10% footfall. 
But the positive has been that over the last eight, nine weeks, they've been coming out less often, so minus 10% footfall. But when they do come out, we've experienced plus 60% average spend. So the, the maths of all this is that actually for a variety retailer that's got something that the consumer wants, and for us that's safety because our stores are large, they're on retail parks, you're not having to take public transport to get to them. Stores that have a wide variety of goods, so whether you need a new toaster or whether you need uh, shampoo or whether you need cornflakes, we've got what you need. And then thirdly, price. Because I think one thing that everyone on this Zoom call will know uh, I, I, my sense is everyone, most of the people on this call are in some way associated with uh, business and commerce. We have the mother of all recessions coming. Yeah. And so in the context of a deep, deep recession coming, uh, discounters uh, play an important part. And the, the last thing I'd say about, you know, let's not be overly pessimistic about bricks and mortar retail, is that online isn't the panacea that we think, not just in terms of the stockpiling issue that I mentioned earlier, but think about the fact that Tesco and Sainsbury's, etc., have had these huge spikes in demand, volume, and they're satisfying it quite rightly, a lot, a lot of it through online. And yet their share prices today, Sainsbury's and Tesco, are below where they were before the crisis. So they're failing to make any money at all out of this huge expansion in demand and the fact they've got a captive market because online grocery retailing doesn't make money. I mean, are you sure about that? Or is that a short term problem where they've obviously had to, in a very short space of time, expand capacity, expand warehousing? And so on. They've obviously had to invest a lot of money to cope with the demand. They have. But I can tell you that for an average basket where you have to go and pick it with someone and give it to that, send it to their house. And you know, they expect to get it pretty much free of charge as a delivery cost. That's very dilutive to earnings relative to the customer coming to you, filling their trolley, putting it in their car and going home. Uh, Simon's absolutely right. Uh, online delivery by the large supermarkets is losing them a huge amount of money. It's almost unsustainable. So, so if the mantra now is, Tom, adapt to survive, it, what's the formula? What do you think that anybody in retail, or is it different? I mean, it, Simon makes the point, a very valid point, that obviously it depends on which sector of retail you're talking about. Clothing's taken a big hit. What do you do? How do you face that challenge? So I agree with Simon. You have to put online into context. In the US, only 10% of sales are online. In the UK, it's almost double at 20%, but bricks and mortar still play a very, very important part. And as Simon said, the supermarket uh, supply chain has held up really well throughout COVID. Mm. And on top of that, supermarkets are seen as a safe place where they can shop and supermarkets are extending what they do. So um, I, I agree with Simon on that. Uh, so in the areas where online is particularly uh, working well, retailers that are involved in those segments have to di uh, go digital or die. They have to be part of it. And you've got the connection between online and bricks and mortar through click and correct, collect. So there is a, a symbiotic relationship between online and people wanting to collect the, collect the products. So overall, I think online will increase. So in terms of there's, there's new services being offered that the supermarkets offer at the moment in terms of where all your basic bulky uh, products are delivered on a monthly basis. So there will be adaptations and things will happen where this, I think the supermarkets will be affected as well. On Just thinking about product. something uh, about fast fashion particularly, do you think there's an age related difference as well? Like we can talk about sectoral difference, but if I think about my children who are in their 20s who love fashion, they love clothes, they never go shopping. Everything happens online. And is that going to be a problem for that? particular sector that actually the bricks and mortar is gone kids don't go shopping in the way that people of my age probably did so i, I, I take a, the point so. uh, sorry it's a massive effect you've got people who live their lives in front of a screen not all their lives are digital and you've got a new generation coming up that uh, 10 year olds 11 year olds that, that are seeing that shops are an unsafe place to be so yeah. and their whole lives are based on likes their 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 friendships are based on likes uh, people are being influenced by influencers rather than uh, the old media that was influencing them. So that whole move 
has to carry on and have a greater and greater impact on what people are going to do with bricks and mortar. It's very easy to sit at home wanting to buy a dress and order six dresses, try them on in, in comfort at home, price transparency, put, see the two that, uh, buy the two that you want, send the other four back. It's so easy to do that. Sorry, Simon. Simon. No, I, sorry, I think the universality of retail is this one theme, which is you have to give the customers something they want. So for some customers, it's the convenience of shopping on your screen and having it delivered to your house and try it and send it back. For other customers, it's the excitement of the treasure hunt. So, for example, going to TK Maxx and looking for a bargain, or in our case, coming to B&M and looking for what we've got new that week because, you know, our version of retail theatre, you know, we don't have fancy shop displays or uh, lots of gimmicky stuff, but the way we create excitement or retail theatre is constant newness. Every week, 100 new lines come into our stores and our shoppers tell us that, half of what they walk out with they hadn't planned on buying but there are other dimensions so it's in town versus out of town i can share with you you know we're in both um you know it's a matter of public record we're trading plus 25 plus 30 percent up on the previous year similar to online success stories like boohoo but behind that headline i can share it with you that in town is terrible whereas out of town is flying and in town is terrible because people aren't going back to the office so a significant proportion of uh, the footfall that you get in town centers is during the lunch hour or after work uh, nipping into the shops you know I'm, I'm in central london today it, it makes you cry i mean i i, I can't imagine how the pret a the itsus the cafes the starbucks are going to survive there's no one here office blocks are empty so that you know that's 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 a cause for concern but so can you make a prediction? I mean, you've talked, I think, at previous um, British Asian Trust events about the importance of location. Where would you, where, where do you have your eye now? Is it those retail parks? Are they coming back after all this effort to revive our cities and persuade us all to use public transport? We're back 20 years, aren't we, in terms of what we think is, is feasible, what we want to do? Uh, we are. So if you look at B&Q, they've just announced a surprise trading update saying we're trading much better than expected, 25% upon the previous year. Donelma trading well, B&M. So in retail parks, the largest occupiers are B&Q, then B&M ourselves, and then you've got Currys, they're trading well. Lots of people are buying TVs and fridges and washing wash machines, and then the likes of Donelm. So out of town is thriving. Town centres, it's a big problem. And um, just as an aside, I've just come back from our French business. The French government have announced no one is building another retail park ever again because they appreciate the... Um, if they allow any more out-of-town development, the town centres will go. And I, I actually don't disagree. I don't disagree. But Simon, you're in a sector which you're providing basic products for price-conscious people. And, and you're in a fortunate position that that, that business is thriving. But in, in the, if you look at um, the role of fashion, when New Look was growing dramatically, it was, we looked at it as a mother-daughter concept. Mothers would go with their daughters, groups of uh, young girls would go out, it would be a leisure experience. There's so many other influences going on now in terms of leisure and other things to do that that, that side of it seems to be disappearing and going online in terms of wanting uh, where you get your entertainment from, where your friendships are for, formed, how you communicate with your friends. So that is definitely going to have an impact in terms of the social interaction between the younger generation that are much more digital. I entirely agree. So um, at the risk of sounding a little bit um, uh, overly cocky, um, I had a rather nice glass of wine to myself last night because we overtook the val no, we overtook Sainsbury's and Morrison's in terms of market value, which you know, given that we've only been doing B&M for 10 to 12 years, thought I could treat myself to a glass of wine. Over. No, no. But the reason I mention it is because of this, because you're absolutely right. The reason why we're trading so well is because People are not spending money on the cinema, the pub, the restaurant. And uh, the other half of what we sell that's not essentials are effectively products for your home, garden, home decoration, DIY. And so people are cocooning. They're spending money on their home because they're spending a lot more time in their home and they're not having money uh, go out of the wallet onto those other leisure activities. But you know, when, when things revert to normal, I, I think the reality is that 
uh, the retailers that are going to be thriving are the ones that have that same mantra in mind. What does the customer want? It might be price, it might be convenience, who knows? But to your point about, Tom, mothers and daughters, so now it's not the mother's influence, is it? It's the influencers. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I, the point I'd make is that even though we are a bricks and mortar retailer that you can't transact with online, um, we put a huge amount of work into our social media presence. And we literally, I think on Monday, we passed uh, the one million mark in terms of um, followers on Instagram. To put that into context, B and Q are 100,000. So, you know, it's, it's a, a, for, a, for us, we, we, we thought that was quite a, quite a nice milestone. Um, because you, the only way to engage with that younger audience is through Instagram. It's not through, you know, their parents tell them that you go and buy your DIY from here, that they'll go where their social media tells them. That's great. Yeah, this business model for a second. I mean, I, I always understood, and, and forgive me, put me right if I'm wrong, that the bricks and mortar aspect of it was obviously about your physical presence on a high street in a retail park, but it was also part of the value of business. Where did you have property? The property was integral to the business uh, plan, to the business growth. Where does that stand now? A property, commercial property value is going to fall? Are rents going to fall? How do you make all this stack up? Tom, what would you be thinking but about? The, the big change in terms of rents is that the, the historically, there was only upward, only rents. And up, they went upward in comparison to your neighbour who paid a bit more, so you had to pay more. That's, that model is broken. Uh, landlords are willing to do whatever deal you want in terms of uh, rent freeze, lower rents, um, and, and there may be a move by the government to do something about rates, which often make up uh, an additional 50 or 60% on top of the... Uh, so that model is, is definitely being broken. But the impact on that is that a lot of people's pension funds are based on retail property and the income that was the solid, that once solid income that used to come out of those situations. And that's that whole change is happening. So the whole, the whole uh, basis of upward only rents Landlords are now talking to their tenants uh, and, and moving to turnover rent. So if you're not doing the business, you don't pay the rent, but you still have to pay the rates. So that is something that will have to be addressed by the government. Tom, I'm pleased you mentioned rates because I know, I know sometimes um, you know, it gets covered in the newspapers and uh, most non-retailers just turn off thinking we're bleating. But the business rate system is just wrong. It's so horribly flawed. It, it makes my blood boil. And, and, and I'll give you two examples as to why it frustrates me so much. So the government announced in the last week that they've delayed the next revaluation so that the next lot of business rate calculations uh, based on, you know, is, has been pushed back to April 2023. And so what that means is that until April 2023, we're all paying business rates as occupiers based on the values of our shops back in 2015, eight years ago. Eight years ago is too long ago for a business that's changing as quickly as retail is changing. And then the second thing they've done, which never gets coverage because it's boring, is that even when at the last uh, revaluation, the 2015 revaluation, all the values were adjusted to reflect the new realities of the post 2008 crash, there's something called transitional relief. And what transitional relief says is that having had all the revaluations, don't worry, your rates on your existing premises won't go up by more than, I think it's five or 10%. And similarly though, they won't go down by more than five or 10%. And in practice, what that has meant is that ever since then, the North, the, the, the struggling, uh, majority of the country geographically that's north of Birmingham where retail rents have collapsed since the 2008-2010 recession our bills haven't come down because they don't want the bills in the southeast to go up too quickly so in other words you've got the underprivileged north subsidizing the southeast it's bonkers so people you know our store in Hartlepool or in Newcastle or in Birkenhead is subsidising the rates of liability of Oxford Street. It's bonkers. I dare, say, I dare say Oxford Street would argue against that, but, but this is a government, of course, that, that came was elected on the basis of levelling up, uh, a project that might be slightly derailed by COVID, but in that context then, 
what would you say, Simon, the government should do in terms of economic stimulus? I was looking at the numbers yesterday and I think uh, there's an estimate that they will have spent three hundred billion pounds by the end of this uh, on COVID. But, you know, how do they deal with the fallout afterwards, the re recession that you referred to at the beginning that is undoubtedly coming? So I, I think they doing the, the furlough scheme was a great scheme. I, I think it was absolutely essential for a lot of businesses to have that. Uh, support so they could have the time to work out how to emerge out of the crisis. I think some of the more recent measures are too, ind too indiscriminate. I don't like the bonus scheme. I don't like the fact that uh, 9 million people times a thousand pound each if they're still in work in January because I think a large part of those 9 million people are working for companies that don't need that money and we've already decided as a board last night in fact that we're not going to take the money even though uh, it would add up to a few million for us. Um, but what can they do? I, mean, they, I mentioned business rates. Um, I, I, I quite like the French uh, example of, look, we need to protect the town centres, so um, let's not have any more out-of-town development. Although that would uh, affect you, know, you, potentially, as a business. I know, but it, you know, sometimes you have to take a step back and look at the, the, the industry, <laughs> rather than, you know, society, rather than just your own business. Uh, but most important, and I think this is the crucial point, the narrative has to change. It has to be that please go back to your workplaces unless you can't, as opposed to please work from home unless you can't. Until we do that, we will not have thriving city and town centres. City centres and town centres exist because that's where people work and create communities and create all the magic that happens in dynamic creative societies and support hospitality industries and restaurants and cafes. They will not exist if we allow ourselves to become a nation or a society of people in their own little bubbles and cocoons and uh, interacting through screens. It's not right. We need to be brave enough to go back to our offices, go back to our workplaces and city centers, because the reality is, if you're a 45 year old, middle-aged person, you're more likely to die falling off a ladder than COVID. It's a fact. <laughs> It's a fact. Tom Singh, what do you think, if you're looking ahead, what, what would you like to see from the government in terms of economic stimulus? I think the government have done lots of, uh, I, uh, Simon's at the coalface and he's a much better to answer that than, than, than I am. Um, but uh, it, it's, you can't reverse the fact that people have found w using Zoom and working from home a very convenient way of doing doing work and there will be a percentage of jobs and a percentage of days where people will carry on working from home uh, because it saves their two hours travel uh, they can they can be just as effective so inevitably it's going to impact the city center and as Simon said central London is absolutely dead there's almost nothing open the place is a ghost town so there has to be some other ways of innovating and finding ways to to revive uh, high streets and, and, and town centres. So um, there has to be a big change. So I've got, I've got a friend who's, who's just buying a shopping centre in, in Madrid that was probably worth 100 million for two and a half million. He's going to spend some money on river, but he's going to have to completely look at make that a, a, a community place where the services that uh, you can't buy online, beauty services, health services, completely change the model of how, how shopping centres uh, are focused entertainment childcare so there has to be a rethink in terms of what you do in it in a, in a, in a town center to make it attractive a much more community space with pop-ups innovation um in, in new products so there, there has to be a complete rethink in terms of what happens to high streets which i have so, uh, two i have two two teenage daughters uh, sorry uh, one's just turned 20 the other one is um about to turn 18. as i think back to being that age, as, as I think back to my first job at the age of 21, going to an office, meeting people who are new colleagues, making friends, meeting people of the opposite sex or you know, future romantic partners, um, that was a great part of my life. And I, I, I worry if we go into a world where when you come out of school or university, your workplace is your kitchen table. It's, it's, it doesn't feel right to me. And I, you know, that energy you get of, being 21 to 25 and meeting people and then everyone's at the pub on the you know on the street level next to the tube station on the way home so, uh, it, it'd be a real shame if we never go back to that but simon i i don't i'm not involved in the process but 
the friends that are dating are dating online. You know, they're on, they're on. I've, I've never done it, so I don't know what it's like. Clicking their screens. <laughs> From retail to dating. This is a fantastic conversation. I'm enjoying it so much. Now I can keep hogging the microphone and I'm very good at that and keep asking questions, but I'd love to hear from all of you. So please do put your hands up. We can open it up to questions. I'm going to keep talking for a couple more minutes, but, but do keep, uh, do put your hands up. We'd love to bring you in. So if there's anything you'd like to ask. In the meantime, I, look, though, I have, I have a, I recognise some of the faces uh, from the gallery view. I'd love to hear um, the audience's, everyone's views on how do we get cities and town centres thriving again? Because I, I, think, I think we all agree that that's a good thing. It would be a shame if they, we don't return to thriving towns and cities. And, and whether that's retail or hospitality, you know, I'd be really interested to hear views on it. Yeah, I'd love to hear that. I mean, London has been, I've been going into London throughout and it, it is, at times it's felt like the zombie apocalypse. The only people there were people with yellow hard hats. It was extraordinary. Um, I don't know, does anybody have a view? Please do put your hands up. It has been an extraordinary time. And I think, as you, as you were saying, you feel extraordinarily sorry for the, for the coffee shops and the sandwich places and that then, you know, potentially none of them will ever come back. And I mean, I think, that's an important point, Simon Aurora. Do you think there are places that won't come back? Do we have to accept that some things are never coming back? Uh, I think it's too early to say. I mean, uh, you hear these optimists saying that by Christmas we'll have a vaccine, in which case perhaps this is a, a V-shaped recovery. Um, but if there is no vaccine, then the model has to change. In other words, we probably have to go to an environment where you don't charge VAT on some of those services so that those businesses can survive um, without quite as much sales density and without quite as much revenue, uh, that they don't ever again pay business rates because they provide a service. Um, you know, I would say a coffee shop, a sandwich bar, a takeaway is, is, a, is a civic need, it's a service. And um, uh, if we don't have those places, rather dull future lies ahead of us. Everyone's being terribly polite and you're not putting your hands up so I'm going to keep talking but please do put your hands up I'll bring you in as, as soon as you do um Simon also to pick up on the point that Tom was just making about shopping centres I mean in two has collapsed which uh, as someone who lives not far from Watford is a subject close to my heart um I mean shopping centres lots of councils have invested in them is it something again a model that perhaps feels very out of step with where we are now psychologically at least so the, the traditional model, of course, was that a, depart, a department store would anchor a shopping mall and everything else would thrive around it. And um, I, I think it almost answers your previous question because the thought hadn't come to my head. But one model that is undeniably broken is the department store model. Um, I can't see that ever coming back. And it's a, it's a global phenomenon, not just a, a UK phenomenon, uh, other than at the very high end. So, yes, of course, there'll always be a Harrods, a Selfridges, a Harvey Nicks. Uh, but um, the, the regional shopping malls, I, I don't see how the department store model survives that. Tom, you're probably closer to that than I am in terms of, um, you know, the reality is most department stores made their money out of clothing, didn't they, rather than my type of product. I agree with you. It's, it's, it's the top end department stores that, uh, that will survive. The others uh, look like dinosaurs. I mean, in the States, they're, they're, they're falling apart. You know, Macy's, Bloomingdale's are either in Chapter 11 or on the verge of it. It's a complete um, destruction of the department store sector. Uh, but as, as we, we, we're linking it to COVID, a lot of these trends, as you, as you said earlier, were happening before and they've just been accelerated. So, um, but, but that's, if you put it into context and look over the last 10, 15, 20 years, there's been a massive, massive growth in retail space. Uh, you've had uh, shopping centers, malls, out of town, big box, Forecourt railing, uh, forecourt retail on pe in petrol stations. Uh, it's just been a massive, massive growth. So even in fashion, you've had a growth from 35 billion to maybe 60 billion over 10 years. So you have to put it into context that there has been a massive growth of retail, and in terms of the number of places you can go to physically. So, um, the, so there had to be. There was a lot of duplication, too much choice. Uh, too many department stores, John, uh, House of Fraser in Oxford Street does the same as Debenhams. Mm. Uh, John Lewis is, is a little bit distinct, probably more likely to survive because of their service ethic. So there was just an overcapacity that had to be 
I had, there's something had to happen. And, and the, the reality is that space needs repurposing. So, you know, as I sit here now, just it sounds ridiculous, but you know, some of these department stores are huge health centers, hospitals, um, call centers, you know, offices, hotels. Uh, it's going to be painful, and the owners of those properties currently are going to lose all their money uh, because, frankly, you're, you're probably down to land value plus a bit uh, because it's, it's not easy remodeling the space. But um, yeah, the problem is there's a lot of it out there. And uh, just you know, up to date picture is that our stores and shopping malls are trading negative like for like, whereas as a whole, uh, Mass Republic record, we're trading plus 25% like for like. So malls are in big trouble. So Simon, how do you how do you respond to the the need for sustainability, less consumption? I know you're in in basic commodity product, but there is a movement towards uh, let's have let's use less, let's preserve the planet. How do you how are you reacting to that from your point of view? So from our point of view, the way we deal with that is by taking the view that if there's going to be less consumption, we need to have a larger slice of the cake because the cake is getting smaller. And so um, we have to be more efficient. We need to be more on trend. We need to be faster. We need to have the more compelling models. So um, for us, uh, it's survival of the fittest. And we just need to make sure that we're fit. I mean, just as uh, we were talking about shopping malls and you know, what can government do, I have to share with you that the, um, the very, you know, today's uh, new regime of having to wear face masks is further bad news for retail. Mm, uh, yeah, I've had my uh, I've had my twelve o'clock numbers through, uh, comparing the morning so far with the previous Friday. It's about fifteen percent down. So um, we need to understand as a society, as a government, when we do these things, you're just adding another problem, another stress to an already stressed industry. So um, I was out in some stores this morning wearing my face mask. It's not comfortable. It's, it's a warm day out there in London. It's, it's, it, was, it was uncomfortable. And, I, and in the one or two stores I was in, I wanted to get out so I could pull it back and breathe normally. Uh, and surprise, surprise, what are we seeing? We're seeing that the average basket in the first few hours of this morning is down on the, uh, what you'd normally expect because people aren't browsing quite as long. They wanted to get back out into the open. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a long way awesome to go before out battle. the hoods between yeah. economy and health isn't there uh, chris nathias i think you had your hand up hi um yeah thanks just learned thanks simon and tom that's been super fantastically interesting um i was challenged by your thought about what would it take to get the town centers um buzzing again and i thought that was a really good question i I was also challenged by the the idea of the French government, you know, um, stopping the the building of, of out of town centres. And I thought, hmm, maybe so. Maybe there's something in these two. However, so long as we don't have a vaccine, which is, I think, a game changer when it comes. So, in the absence of a vaccine, is what I'm talking about. Because if there is a vaccine, I think everything changes straight away, particularly if it comes soon. Um, but in the absence of a vaccine then uh, I think to revitalize town centers requires a complete rethink of how we live. Because if you take London as an example, you cannot have this kind of donut with loads of people in the outer rings traveling in on public transport in crowded and cramped conditions if there is a virus and there is no vaccine. Uh, notwithstanding that the risk for many of them is less than falling off a ladder, that's just, just an awful lot of them. Um, so, you know, in numbers, that still becomes big. And, and, uh, and they won't travel. I wouldn't under those circumstances. If I were traveling in from here in Horsley to Waterloo on a crowded train, um, I wouldn't. Even with face masks, I wouldn't. Uh, so, so that requires rethinking how people live, where they shop, how cities work, because the current model, I, I just, you know, you could improve public transport and help a bit, but the current model I just don't think can, can create vibrant town centres 
with a donut of people living outside. Mm. And you're right, the credit. Chris. Sorry, you're right, Chris. This this issue has been there pre-COVID. Uh, if you remember, you had uh, Mary Portas doing a, a series of things for the government. How do we revive high streets? So this decline in the high street and town centres has been going on uh, a lot longer than, and it's just been made more, uh, it, a lot more focused. So it is an issue that needs to be addressed and, and there needs to be innovation and new ways of get, building communities in town centres that are attractive and innovative. So, sorry, Chris. Uh, sorry, Simon. So I, I was going to give credit where it's due. So one of the recent announcements from the government was this presumption on in planning terms that I think commercial property can be repurposed as residential because you know the reality is a lot of that space that is retail, the overcapacity that Tom very accurately um, described needs to be converted to residential. But but it needs to be joined up thinking because it's no put no put no point putting all this extra residential space in into our town and city centres if you also haven't got good schools, playing fields, uh, you know all the ancillary bits and pieces that you need in order to create a residential community because you know, the reason why I'm sure most of us on this call have moved out to the suburbs is for the schools and the green spaces and if they don't exist in city centre Barnsley or city centre Sheffield you're not going to deal with the problem. Manoj Badale, I think you had your hand up and then you took it down but I'm going to ask you if you'd like to speak anyway. Yeah no um, uh, just to echo Chris's comments actually uh, the discussion has been fascinating so far. I suppose a question to both Simon and Tom really going to Simon's issue or challenge about how to rethink city centres and it strikes me that you've got two different issues that we're discussing today one is the sort of rethinking of retail and the second is the rethinking of the real estate in which retail exists and so I wonder if a clearer separation of those two challenges helps brainstorm helps identify some of the solutions and something certainly we've been thinking a bit about as we ourselves have excess retail sorry excess property uh, in town centers like Hammersmith is whether or not there's a confluence of opportunity around the enormous reskilling requirements that are required across the country and again we've got a sort of slightly I think blinkered view of how this reskilling is going to take place, whether it's going to take place within employers, whether it's going to take place within schools or colleges or universities, because you have got this enormous population out there that won't get access to that reskilling, either because they don't have access to the digital infrastructure or they don't have access to the um, educational institute, or bluntly because they're out of work and therefore don't have access to the employers and I do wonder whether there's an opportunity to create a sort of movement around reskilling hubs where retailers who have excess property have staff that can manage those centers have customer services capabilities could actually be part of that movement I sort of was interested as to whether um, you know Simon or Tom uh, saw any um, you know any validity to that thought so I, where I'm at on this is that politicians get very excited about reskilling into the sexy industries, biotechnology, um, gaming, software, um, artificial intelligence, uh, all that sort of stuff. And I, I sometimes worry that they're not being realistic. When you're thinking about a 55-year-old colleague made redundant from Debenhams who's worked in a shop all his or her life, they're not going to be doing biotech or uh, software coding. It's just, you know, it's, that's a big ask. And whilst we need to, that, those industries clearly are the future, we need to be able to create a glide path. Uh, we need to be able to soften or slow down the pace of change so that people just don't fall out of the system and end up being permanently unemployed and on benefits. And for me, that's where the leveling up of the tax regime is all important. What I mean by that, of course, is Amazon paying no tax, Google paying no tax, um, online retailers paying no business rate for bricks and mortar stores, um, whereas the older model is massively taxed. Uh, we, in order to slow down the rate of change and to uh, you know, 
create some employment, some ongoing employment for that 55 year old in Barnsley. Um, we can't have a situation where if you buy a shirt in a store, effectively there's a 5% surcharge because it was bought in a store. 5% actually is the business rates part of that transaction. In some retail stores, it's 7%. It's a big number. So the online retailer, the Boohoo or the ASOS, is automatically given a 5% uh, easier ride. So and that's, you know, they're at 18 pounds rather than 20 pounds. We need to level that up before thinking about, okay, this industry inevitably is going to lose jobs over the years to come. I think, Ritalo, you mentioned 70,000, 100,000 people. Let's try and minimize that because not all 100,000 of them are going to become uh, software programmers in the next five years. So, Tom, do you see an opportunity in this crisis? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the point that was made about innovating and finding new ways of using space and reskilling people and, and is, is great. But if you look, you need to think about there's fundamental changes in society that were happening anyway. If you look at today's 10 year old whose, whose life is, is on a screen, it's digital, even more than the, the, your generation, your, your daughter who's 20. It's gonna, that's going to increase. Is that 10 year old when, when, when he or she is 20 going to be interested in going to the equivalent of Starbucks? Will they be interested in bookshops? Will they be interested in going to the cinema? When all of this stuff is, is immediately available in, in a different format. Yeah. So there's quite a fundamental shift going on here. We're sort of looking at some of the areas that are being affected today. But if you're going to look at a, at a more holistic solution, you need to look into the mindset of the current younger generation. That's, that's, that are going to be the shoppers of the future. I know that's a bit of a, a, a blue sky way of, of, of a focus, but that's where we need to focus to see where, what, what are these people going to be interested in? How, how, are, they going to, how are they going to live? To me, there are, two different, well, there are two different work streams, aren't they? So Tom's right. There is a work stream around what do we do about the 10 year old that is not interested in all these things we're trying to protect. Whereas I'm saying, yeah, that's absolutely the correct work stream in terms of a 10, 20 year view. But there's also a work stream around the next five years. What do we need to do tactically around the next five years to minimise the pain of these long term structural trends? Gosh, it's a big thought. Um, well, wait, uh, J Jitesh has joined us and uh, he's probably closer than most of us to uh, how government are thinking about this very topic. So Jitesh, go on, I'm, I've put you on the spot. What, what, what's, what's happening? Um, well, sorry, I, I mean, I, I was actually listening in um, <laughs> to my car and then I logged on. So I, I did actually get most of the, the discussion and it's uh, been excellent. So I echo the comments. Well, give us the inside track. Come on. What's, what's, but, how, how do you, where do you see the government positioning itself? We've got a couple of minutes left. Go on. Sure. Okay. Well, look, I think the, the, the business folk are, are, are ahead, well ahead of the politicians on this. Um, we do need to, I think, reimagine both offices and high streets. Um, for offices, I, you know, I think Simon, although we can implore people to, to go back, the reality is work home forever for some people is, a, is bliss, right? So we can't, we're accelerating a trend which we're going to have to cater for. So we do need to reimagine offices and people may go in a couple of days a week, but other reasons for social reasons for training reasons whatever and therefore we need to, to deal with that on the high street um i think your point on business rates is bullseye i i we will have to have a separate conversation about this but i i feel very very strongly that unless we we've got the holiday now for retail hospitality leisure but you know, come next april this is going to be a bloodbath unless we deal with this properly. Um, I do think that there is some, I'm sorry to get technical, but I think that, that you know, the, the rezoning is not yet, uh, the re permitted development rules are not yet baked in. And how you do it and the incentives and the price signaling of a combination of um, business rates plus uplift in values for high street sites is key to unlocking this and i sort of think that we need some value capture or land value capture or what brownfield value capture from in from private to public 
in order to help some of the reimagining. Um, and I, I wrote a, a paper with Sir Oliver Letwin on, on this subject in, in, the, in relation to housing. I think we need to apply some of that to, um, to high streets. Uh, so they effectively, lo local authorities can create master plans for high streets and then make it happen. That's absolutely fascinating. Um, it feels to me like we need to have another conversation actually about city centres and what we can do about cities. Some very big thoughts. Um, Simon and Tom, I know Simon, you need to get away. Uh, we've got a minute left or so, each of you. I mean, if you've got one big thought then, thinking about the biggest impact, positive or negative, of COVID on retailing, on, on yes, retailing, what, what would it be? Simon, you can go first. Um, it, it, it's a sentiment expressed earlier. Uh, for those of you in retail, and we've got friends in retail, survival of the fittest. So keep your costs down, make sure your products are attractive. Uh, and what I said earlier, always have what the customer wants not what you think they want okay and tom what would your thoughts so as an ex-retailer i'm not going to be quite so commercial um it's there's been a focus on family there's been a focus on well-being there's been a focus on on looking at the world and, and thinking about uh, more deeper things and maybe a, a kind of society so maybe i don't know <laughs> <laughs> well on that lovely uplifting thought thank you very much to both simon and tom it's been absolutely fascinating i've really enjoyed it uh, and i'm sure everybody listening has too i'm going to hand back to richard but thank you very much thank you thanks ever so much Ritala. um thanks ever so much simon and tom i'm sure everybody agrees that was absolutely fascinating um, unfortunately we do have a have a hard stop but it, it sounds like we need to all help Simon out every Friday from, from now on, put our masks on and head down to B&M to get those, those numbers up. Uh, although Simon, I think you're about to put your mask on and head off to the, to the airport for a romantic weekend away with Shalini for your 25th wedding anniversary. So uh, we wish you and Shalini all the best for that, that, that weekend. Um, thanks ever so much, Ritala as well. Really appreciated you finding the time uh, to, to host that discussion. Uh, which I'm sure everybody has found absolutely um, it, it, absolutely fascinating, as we said. Uh, thank you all for joining us today as well. Um, I know how busy everyone is at the moment. Really appreciate uh, all of our supporters that have, that have joined today uh, coming along to this event. Please do look out for the future events that we have in this programme of BAT Insights. Um, next week, we're trying to squeeze one more in before the summer. Next week, we have an excellent one with Christian Turner, the British High Commissioner to Pakistan. Uh, so if you haven't registered for that yet or you want more information about that, please do let me know. Um, and obviously many of our supporters have been suggesting subjects for these discussions. So if any of you have any ideas at all or any subjects that you think would be good for us to, to cover, then please just let us know and we'll pick that up and uh, take that forward. So thank you very much indeed once again to Ritala, to Simon and Tom, really appreciated you putting the time in uh, and supporting the British Asian Trust in this way. And thank you all, everybody else for joining us and for your time and for your continued interest in and support of the British Asian Trust. Thank you very much indeed and hope uh, you all- Thank you, Richard. Thank you for hosting. Thanks, Richard. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much.